Welcome. I'm Jane Molden. I'm the Interim Director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, ISSI, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's conference, sponsored by ISSI and one of the ISSI centers, the Center for Research on Social Change. I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Divisions of Equity and Inclusion, the College of Environmental Design, School of Social Welfare, Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program, the Center for the Study of Law and Society, the Center for Race and Gender, American Cultures, Graduate School of Education, and the Departments of Sociology, Anthropology, and Ethnic Studies. So today's conference features alumni of our Graduate Fellows Program. And I want to acknowledge the three training coordinators of the program, Christine Trost, Deborah Lustig, and David Minkus. Yes, a round of applause for those three wonderful training coordinators. Now, David has been training graduate students at ISSI for the past 35 years. And today, you will hear about some of his contributions. And Christine and Deborah organized this conference, and I want to thank them for their work in doing so. And I want to give them a big, another round of applause for this. We now, all right, and a reminder before we begin, please silence your cell phones. I'm delighted to have with us today our new Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, Claude Steele. Prior to coming to Berkeley, he served as the I. James Quillen Dean for the School of Education at Stanford University from 2011 to 2014. And then from 2009 to 2011, he was the 21st Provost of Columbia University, and prior to that, he had held appointments as a Lucy Stern Professor in the Social Sciences, as Director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and as Director of the Center for Advanced Studies uh, for Comparative Studies in Race and Eth sorry, for the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, all at Stanford. Professor Steele is recognized as a leader in the field of social psychology and for his commitment to the systematic application of social science to problems of major societal significance. His recent book, Whistling Vivaldi, How Stereotypes Affect Us and What We Can Do, was published in 2010. And Professor Steele has received numerous fellowships and awards, including the Dean's Teaching Award from Stanford and the Senior Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychology and the Public Interest and the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the American Psychological Association. So please join me in welcoming Professor Steele. Thank you, Jane. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I feel kind of home here. I used to direct an institute that was conceived of in the, in the same way that shared a mission with this one, and so it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I've known Troy for a long time. When I think of Berkeley, I think of Troy. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to come here and help out. Uh, I, I really am uh, uh, brand new. Uh, yesterday was my one month anniversary on the job. <laughs> so um, I don't have deep understandings of Berkeley yet. I'm in quest of them. I'm going around trying to, uh, uh, to gather that. Um, uh, but I do have a couple of, uh, of impressions that might uh, in, in serve as a kind of introduction to uh, the, the day's conference that I know you're about to, uh, to have. Uh, and, they're, you know, they're very st strong, immediate impressions you get as you move into this uh, university uh, community. Uh, <clears throat> and I think they're, they speak to the singularity of, of Berkeley as an institution, as a, as a university. There's some things that are just distinct about it. Um, one, the first one, is, is one that I, that I can describe with a couple of factoids, and these are factoids that, that I know many of you know and have heard, but when you put them together, it, it kind of creates a, a whole, a whole impression of the institution that is greater than some of the parts. Uh, you know, the, 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 the first factoid is that it is such a powerful uh, academic institution. Uh, I think it has more, the, the, the factoid I've heard is it has more departments ranked in the top five nationally than any other university except Harvard. So it is a huge and powerful academic uh, uh, institution. It's ranked in the Shanghai ratings, I think, third in the, in the world as the greatest 
third greatest institution of higher education in the world. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it, is, it is a public institution with a, with a real public uh, mission and that, that serves uh, as, I think, one of our nation's primary uh, institutions of upward mobility. Uh, one little uh, statistic I was just pulling out of some charts that I was shown, uh, uh, Berkeley has uh, twice as many uh, low-income students, for example, elite low-income students, twice as many as uh, a, 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 a school like Stanford has students. So the combination of, of, of things uh, uh, is quite amazing, the achievement of, as an institution of uh, that kind of thing, such academic excellence cu coupled with such uh, a broad access and, and uh, the, the, you know, it gives, there's a sort of scalability to the excellence of, of Berkeley that I think is especially impressive and you get that when you come here. Uh, it's, it's an impression that jumps out at, at you. It's, a, it's an amazingly good school and it's an amazingly, and it, and it does it at a, at a scale that I don't think anywhere else does it quite like this. So that, that's uh, an impression. Another impression that may be even related to that, and it relates more directly to uh, this institute and this event, uh, is that Berkeley is committed to, it uh, believes in change, uh, that society can change and should change, and that Berkeley can play a role in that change. Uh, it believes in all of those, those things, which is remarkable. You know, most institutions don't do, they don't believe in change. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of orthogonal to it. It's not that they're against it or for it necessarily, but they don't have it as a really core part of their identity. And Berkeley really does have uh, the idea that society can and should change as a part of its DNA, of a part, of, a part of its core uh, identity. And you see it in all kinds of, uh, of, of, of manifestations. I was just uh, in this room a week ago today uh, celebrating the, um, the uh, American culture's uh, uh, requirement, course requirement, general education requirement here at Berkeley. And Pedro Negrero spoke, and he described the role of Berkeley in, in the, uh, the, the divestment movement in, in uh, South Africa and how Mandela himself had pointed to the role that, Mandela and the, that, the, that Berkeley and the demonstrations had played in, in that uh, divestment movement. And, you know, and that's just one little... Uh, example, there's the free speech movement most famously and all kinds of other uh, manifestations of this. Uh, Berkeley believes in that, that it, it can uh, in, in change and it believes somehow that the expressions of a university can foster change in the larger society. That, that is to me a really distinct and amazingly important uh, uh, part of, uh, of Berkeley's uh, character. And, and this institute seems to be an institutionalization of that value, of that dimension of, of uh, uh, Berkeley's character. Uh, it's, it's been here for a long time. Uh, the work that it's done over a long period of time has, has sort of fostered the ideal that academic work, that research, serious, rigorous thought, research can uh, foster constructive change in society around some of our most uh, important challenges and, and that uh, uh, that that is a way of working for change, is doing the scholarship, the research, uh, the science that can enlighten us and, and uh, uh, foster change and foster wise change. So uh, I'm, all I can say is uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of this institution. I feel at home in, uh, on this, insti in this institute. Uh, it's a great... Uh, uh, pleasure to have a chance to kick it off today, and uh, I wish you the happiest of, of days. I'm sure you'll, you will have that. I, I get in the air that there's a big sense of reunion going on here, that there are a lot of people who are uh, coming back together who, who haven't seen each other in a while and are gathered around this, this uh, uh, institute. So um, uh, have the best of days, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Steele. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Troy Duster. Troy Duster is Chancellor's Professor at UC Berkeley. 
He has served as president of the American Sociological Association and as chair of the board of directors of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. He is the principal author of the Diversity Project, a study of the transformation of the demographic and social characteristics of undergraduate students at UC Berkeley during 1970 to 1990, from 1970 to 1990. And um, we're giving away copies of the final report from the Diversity Project. So please take one from the back of the room if you would like that. Uh, Professor Duster's books and monographs include The Legislation of Morality, Aims and Control of the Universities, Cultural Perspectives on Biological Knowledge, which was co-edited with Karen Garrett, and Backdoor to Eugenics. And he is the co-author of Whitewashing Race, the Myth of a Colorblind Society. He is also the author of a number of articles in journals such as The American Sociologist, Tom Modern, and The Politics and the Life Sciences. Professor Duster in founded the Institute for the Study of Social Change, or ISSC, in 1976, and he served as director for more than 20 years until 1998. ISSC later became the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, and we're very pleased to have had the benefit of his guidance for almost 40 years now. And please join me in welcoming Professor Duster. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, the, the title is Breaking Barriers, and so what I want to do is to uh, put a little framework on the, on the barriers that we face uh, without having it be glum or negative, but just to put this into perspective. Um, social change is painful. So what I mean by that is, if society is static, uh, people in power more or less happy with that. But when you talk about change, and if you're effective, that means there's some kind of a subterranean, sometimes at a policy level, some, some transformation happening, which reshapes that notion of who has power and why. So right at the very beginning of the idea of social change, there is a level of disruption that some people are going to find problematic, difficult, Indeed, they would not like to see it happen. So there are barriers. Now, I want to divide my remarks into uh, two different segments. The first will be a socio-historical analysis of the Institute's origins and some of the problems that we faced, and of course, some of the successes that we've had. That would be the social history. The second part, I want to spend some time giving you a picture of the role that the graduate field research training program played in this whole 35, 40 year history, and why it was so central to the development of social change scholarship. And thus, the role of its director, David Minkus, as being vital to the success. But let me step back um, and give you a, a quick overview of the kinds of issues that we faced from the very beginning. Now, every, every five years, the graduate division has a review process. They appoint a committee of senior faculty to come and review every institute every five years. And one of the recurring themes over those many reviews was that the faculty committee would sometimes, I mean, often ask the question, this institute's concerned with social change. Now the title is the study of social change. And we need to make a distinction here, so please give us your best shot. Is this, is this the study of social change? or you're trying to affect social change. Which is it? So there was always this kind of discomfort, and I think I need to provide a kind of sociological analysis of why that discomfort is very basic inside the academy. Now, Paul Claude Steele is correct to say that Berkeley does have a reputation for being sympathetic to social change. When you're in the process, things are a bit more complicated. For example, um, here's one, one of the kinds of questions we would get. Um, there is somehow a distinction between studying social change and trying to affect it. And the idea was pretty basic to many of my colleagues, not all of them, 
and these review committees, that you couldn't have both. That you either had to emphasize the study of change, because if you were interested in the outcomes of social transformation, you couldn't be neutral. You couldn't be scientific. You couldn't be um, technically, methodologically able to disentangle your concern about outcomes of change with the whole notion that you're simply a scientific investigator. Now, there, there is a bias here that value-free neutral investigation uh, is not about change. But that bias is mainly placed upon the social sciences, not upon the natural sciences, not upon the physical sciences. Um, and he here's the way it, it shapes out. If you're concerned about, let's say, diabetes, and you're in the biological sciences, and what you want is to transform the practices of diabetes tr treatment and therapy so that it's a more effective treatment, that's possibly seen as change. But no one criticizes the biologists for instituting a program which is out to affect treatment change with diabetes. But if you're interested in the Pima Indians and their high rates of diabetes, and you're anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists, economists, and you say you want to go into these communities to understand the nature and character of social relationships, nutritional practices, the, the structure of, of, of our opportunities, um, there is some notion that you're interested in the outcome of social change as opposed to understanding its neutrality. Now there is in this binary connection a transparent fiction that somehow you can pull these two things apart, analytically you can, but empirically in the social sciences that's a huge, huge fiction. I'll give you an example of the work of my colleague uh, Harry Levine, who's now reached almost a mythic stature in New York City. Why? Because Harry for the last five years has been studying marijuana arrests, stop and frisk. And Harry is hardly neutral. He's inter interested in putting a light on this topic in order to understand the nature and character of police behavior and the fact that marijuana arrests, um, as he points out, in New York City are disproportionate to those who are engaged in, quote, the offense. So Harry's research produced the following kind of quick figure. He said, look, um, the, the, the data are in Latino, white, and black teenagers beginning about age 16 all the way up through their mid and late 20s. Uh, they all have the same rate of consumption when it comes to marijuana. But in New York City, and indeed across the country this is true, the ratio of arrests are about 7 to 1. People of color get arrested for marijuana consumption, or, uh, possession rather, than, uh, than do, do, do whites. Then he moved to stop and frisk. If you read the papers of the last year, you'll see what the, quote, social change issue was there because uh, Christine Quinn, who was running for, uh, in the primary for the slot to become mayor, had a huge lead on de Blasio. Uh, and suddenly de Blasio comes out and he attacks stop and frisk and marijuana arrests. And within three weeks, he jumps to a 15-point lead in the polls and he's citing continuously the work of Harry Levine on stop and frisk and marijuana arrests. Now, you can see in that example that this notion that you can pull apart studies of social life as if you were the neutral scientific investigator with no interest in the outcome is problematic. But that was the way in which we began to face the issue um, when it came to the study of social change. One other quick story about this, which I love to tell because it, um, it captures in a kind of graphic way the problem. At the end of the 1980s, early 90s, there was a real issue in this country about how to deal with what was seen as a surge in violence all across the country. And the NIMH, Mental Health Institute in Washington, was funding research on the topic. 
And the director of the institute was, um, I think, um, he's a medical doctor, certainly he was in the natural sciences, and he had a very controversial press, uh, uh, controversial press conference. In that conference, um, in, in a discussion with his colleagues, he said, well, well, he understood what the problem was because, and I'm paraphrasing, but not too far, he said, because in the cities, uh, we have this kind of jungle-like behavior. He said, it's not an act that we call it uh, uh, urban jungle, because like rhesus monkeys in the wild, when people have a lot of sexual competition and they're engaged in certain kinds of behaviors, uh, they kill each other. A in response to that, the head of the National Institute of Health and Health and Human Services decided that they'd put together a commission right away to uh, investigate this notion of violence in America. This person got demoted from his position at the NIMH, um, and a commission was formed. And that commission was called the National Violence Prevention Commission, and I was appointed to be one of the members. And very quickly, the commission divided into two f different groups. The first group, headed by a biochemist, and the quote, you'll hear the story here, the, the real scientist, uh, he took the view that violence could be understood by what he kept calling basic processes. We kept wondering what he meant by that. Um, well, he meant that, you know, people commit violence because they have a biochemical imbalance, they have a neurological problem, they have a genetic disorder, and we have to get into the basic processes. The other half of the commission, commit, uh, primarily social scientists, said, well, wait a minute. 60% of all homicides in the U.S. Are, are committed in the black community, mainly black on black crime. You want to get it to the question of violence in the black community, why would you go to the neurological, bioscience, biochemical level? And he kept coming back to the same idea. We were interested in, quote, basic processes. And we un a light bulb went off in my head. So what they mean is, if it's something, quote, inside the human body, if it's the amygdala flashing you know, with, with these lights, neuroscience, if, if it's biochemistry, if it's genetics, that's called science. That's basic science. And then he said it. He said, what you're talking about is policy, social policy, about poverty, education, early stage nutrition. That's not science, that's policy. And policy then gets transmogrified into political. If it's political, then it's not neutral. So you see the kind of self-fulfilling circle going on with the study of violence. You couldn't even talk about violence without talking about what's happening in the society and the nature and character of violence in that period was rather sharply along these racial and ethnic lines. Now, um, the Institute begins in this kind of a framework of colleagues who were studying social change. Arlie Hochschild's work, in which he was looking at the transformation of sex roles in post-war America, later became a book called The Second Shift. And Arlie wasn't concerned simply in describing the fact that women were moving into the workforce and that it was transforming sex roles in, in, the, in the society, in the family, and in the workplace. It was everywhere. And her book was, her account, her study uh, at the Institute was all about this focus upon this issue, which would, of course, have it as not so subterranean message, there needed to be social change. David Matza and David Wellman worked with Herb Mills on a project on the Longshore. And again, post war America saw this huge shift on the longshore. Longshore it had been primarily manual labor. Thousands of longshore would, would get, uh, go, go to the, the docks, the piers, and they would unload by hand these items. Well, th within the next uh, 20 years after the war, we began to go to uh, these huge craters, and, we, uh, and there, therefore the, the character in longshoring was to shift. Social change would begin to reshape the whole idea of what it meant to be a longshoreman. And indeed, computers began to take over and how we began to think about unloading and loading onto these boats. Well, 
There are another four or five projects which I won't go into. Um, my own work was on genetic screening. Um, there were several other projects. And now we come to the graduate training program and what it looked like. We had the idea that we would have a program where graduate students would spend perhaps six months, maybe at most a year, on each of these projects as an assistant. They would be in the field working with people in field research and they would rotate every six months onto a new project. So part of the project would be, let's say, with my work on genetic screening, part would then move to early Hochschild's work on transformation of sex roles, part would be in the long shore, and then they would come together every two or three weeks to meet with David Minkus as the director of field research training. Little backdrop to what was going on. In, this early in the 70s and in the early 80s, this program was heavily funded by the Institutes of Mental Health in Washington, the NIMH. And we had enough resources that we could, have, we could fund about 10 to 12 graduate students for their full load, and we could hire a director of the program. That was David Minkus. But this, this was to happen right at the same time that Reagan came to power in 1980, and we had high marks from the National Institutes of Mental Health program, but there'd been a shift in ways of thinking about mental health. The NIMH came in the form of its, um, one of its program directors to visit me. And what he said, without again, in, very much in the way of editorializing, what he said was, we at the NIMH have decided that mental health actually is a matter of neurological, biochemical, genetic issues. And you need to put on your staff a medical doctor and perhaps even, if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, a geneticist. We want to therefore shift the whole notion of a training program away from field research out in the society. We want to take it back into a notion and a study of mental health as a neurological problem. Indeed, there had been a task force which even said in the 1979 period, they said, NIMH, Mental Health Institute, has been polluted by social science research. That the real issue, they called it manic depressive then, manic depressive, not bipolar, schizophrenia, um, th these issues are not to be understood in terms of anything other than basic issues inside the body. So the NIMH during the early Reagan years would take our score, which was very high, and say, well, the score is high, but you don't have medical doctors or geneticists on your, on your staff. And I actually, again, I got this visit saying, you need to change and break, make this program much more concerned with neurological, biochemical, genetic issues. Um, but I was a bit stubborn and resistant, and so I said, no, I'm not going to do that, because I had information, I had been in touch with the then Chancellor, Mike Heyman, and the then Dean, Sandy Elberg, and they had been saying to me over and over again, this program is such a valuable one, the NIMH program at Berkeley, that I was the director of, it's so valuable, it's producing such good outcomes that we will backstop it. So then I called them on it. I said, NIMH has just come to see me and told me that I must medicalize. Heyman and Elberg said, um, let's have a conversation. They talked to people in Washington, and indeed, they, they had a compromise. A compromise, they would defund most of the program, especially anything uh, with respect to the director of position or, or my half-time appointment. Um, they, they would continue to have maybe six students, but not 12. Heyman and Elbrick said, we will backstop the program. And they did. And the reason was because the NIMH program here had been producing uniquely across the country the highest ratio, the highest proportion of students of color, Native American, Asian American, Latino American, African American. Over 75 PhDs came out of this program over the last over the period when I was directed between 1977 and uh, about 2000. It was the model program for the country. Hawaii mimicked us. 
and they were producing maybe a 12 or 15 over that period. But the Berkeley program had become a national model and Ken Lutterman at NIMH had gone around the country saying this should be the model for the country. So Heyman and Elberg saw the virtue of this and quickly made the decision to fund the Institute's program without regard to its medical, biological, biochemical input or not. Now to the role of uh, David Minkus. What you'll hear today are outcomes of Minkus's, let me just say it, uh, genius when it comes to dealing with graduate students. What Minkus can do is to take a student uh, into his office and hear an account of what they intend to do. And what David will hear is some kind of imbalance between theoretical interests, strong concern about a way of thinking, and say, well, but you're not dealing with an empirical problem that's of any consequence. So he'll try to redress that balance by talking to students about how they need to find an empirical site in which the theoretical issues that they're dealing with have some kind of reason, to, some kind of interplay, and say, indeed, some kind of issue of social change. The flip side, students will come in with a strong empirical problem. They'll want to address or deal with, and now it could be diabetes, it could be violence, and they have a focus on it. And what David will do in the course of often two, three hours of conversations, he'll find a way to reshift that balance to make it more like one should be engaged in a process of understanding its theoretical, analytic implications, policy-wise. So on the one hand, um, you would think that usually a director would have a way of thinking, which is, we want more theory or we want more empirical research. Um, Mencus's capacity to take almost any problem and to reconceptualize it so that there's nuance, texture, multi-tiered, multi-faceted ways of approaching it to get at the issue of student engagement. And, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about this tonight, but what happens in that situation is the students suddenly think that they found a voice, their own voice. And they'll come out saying, well, sometimes years later, uh, you know, I had this idea. <laughs> and uh, then they'll remember that it happened uh, in, in the office of, uh, of David Minkus. I, I need to, um, to, to sort of re reframe this. I, I want to conclude here by talking about what it means to find one's, one's voice. Um, I, I'm on the board of trustees at uh, Mills College. And at Mills, many don't even know the story, but about 20 years ago, there was a huge rebellion where Mills College, a uh, women's college here in the Bay Area, Mills College decided to go co-educational. And the board of trustees in 19, uh, could have been the early 90s, decided that uh, the time had come. Um, and there was a student revolt. There was a student rebellion. Uh, lasted a, a, a very long time, at least eight or 10 months. And, Finally, the Board of Trustees uh, um, recapitulated and went back to Mills as an all-women's college. One of the things that ha I've heard repeatedly about that rebellion, and it's still part of the mantra at Mills College, is that it needs, it needs to be a, a women's college because in those situations, what these young women are finding is that their voices are suddenly heard and they're, quote, finding a voice. That in, their, in a classroom of uh, with many men, they find sometimes that they're not heard. And these experiences in this all-women's college over a period of three, four, sometimes five years, it's one which is transformative of their self-conceptions and they, quote, find their voice. Well, that's the magic of the field research training program. It was that students who were in departments of political science, um, architecture, public policy, would be over in their departments and they would find that they were at the margins. They were concerned about social change, transformation of society. And yet the dominant framing of their experience in those departments was, as I said at the very beginning, we want you to be very careful 
distinguish between social change studying and social change as an outcome. And so the, the hegemonic framing in political science or economics or any of these fields is the detached, neutral investigation. Social change, that's, you know, maybe if it comes, fine. But we want neutrality. So like Mills College, what was happening here was that students were coming into the program from other departments and they were often voiceless. But they would find in this new scene, this rotational structure I gave, with spokes of a wheel, working in different programs, coming together uh, every two or three weeks in those years to discuss them. They found their voices. They found that they were able to articulate issues which all this now was in a sympathetic environment. And like the analogy to, I gave to Mills College, this finding of one's voice became vital. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in situations around the country, uh, various lectures, where students who were in this program, and uh, again, more than 75 took their PhDs here, they would come up to me and they, they would say, you know, when I was at Berkeley, I was very, very quiet and very silent in my first couple of years. And it was only in that last period in this training program that I literally was able to find my voice. And again, what you will hear in the next few hours, if you're stinking around, sticking around for the program, is how this comes into fruition. How these many students who've been here in this training program spent time engaged in research and engaged in a conversation with the, I will call it the senior mentor of the program, David Minkus, over 35 years, and have come to some fruition with the discovery of their own voice. Rather than taking up the rest of my time, which is another 10 minutes in this monologuing, I, I, want, I want to end here on the, in this note that engagement with the audience is as much a process and an important thing as it is with me talking. So I'd like to end my remarks here. And if there are questions, observations, reflections, um, now is the time. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. There is, there's a microphone here which uh, Deborah will give to anyone who wants to have a comment, reflection. It needn't be a question, it can just be a, a comment. Right behind you there. Thank you very much, Troy. Uh, 1976? 76 was the original. Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of the institute. It was also the end of the School of Criminology. Yes. A tough time on campus. Was there any connection or any resistance? Well, of course, there, there's a connection in the following way. Um, criminology in the early years, in the 50s and the 60s, had been a police training operation. So you went to criminology to get a degree so that you'd become a better or a more uh, bureaucratically attractive police chief. Um, by the 60s, the explosion that happened, and so people in criminology uh, were often attracted by um, People like Jer Jerome Skolnick went over to criminology, Shelley Messenger. These were sociologists interested in theory and transformation and change. And now criminology became a focal point for a new kind of police work. And so a dozen police, office, pl police captains came out of that school with a whole different framing about police work, community, community policing. Um, Lee Brown, who became commissioner of uh, New York City, police commissioner. Um, there was a, a North Carolina's police chief came out of Berkeley. There were another eight or ten I could mention. The point of the story is that these police chiefs were making a huge difference in policing practices around the country. And it caught the attention of my colleagues in the Academic Senate who began these five-year reviews. And they would say things like, are you interested more in training police chiefs who are going to make change and trouble or just p policing behavior as usual? Uh, I'm being a little bit lib, but not too much, because Ronald Reagan took power in that period, in the early 80s. Um, but in the period before he took power, he'd run against the university. And the way in which policing was occur police training was occurring was a big theme in his, uh, in his quest to be governor. So it, it came to pass that uh, criminology was reviewed by a faculty committee. The faculty committee said something like I said earlier, which is, this is, this is not, pol not police training. You're training people for transformation and change. 
We had that over in, in sociology with uh, Matza and uh, uh, sociologists over there. We don't need it in the criminology school. We, we want police training. The actual decision to end criminology was about this rotational shift. And again, Claude Steele was partly correct saying Berkeley is reputation is about social change. But up close, in the interior, the resistance to change was such that criminology got the ax for this very issue. I've uh, been at the Institute for Study of Social Change from 1988 to uh, 2011, courtesy of Troy. So this is a, a question that you've heard before, but let me ask it again. It's about data, the kinds of data that we use to study community issues and community processes. Um, mm -hmm. In the public health and public safety world, there's a strong emphasis on quantitative data and on uh, the use of mm -hmm. police statistics, uh, archival information on service delivery. There's also a, a lot of use of um, qualitative data, key informant interviews, uh, focus groups, and in the policy making process, blending those kinds of data to represent problems with communities that address some of the transformational issues that we're talking about, mm -hmm. the imbalances of power, um, inappropriate uses of force, uh, failures of policy to do what they're supposed to do. We get into huge debates and we often get snarled in local discussions about what's real information yes. and how do we use it. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Surely. Well, first of all, there's this distinction between policy, which is top-down. People in positions of power, they have policy positions, as opposed to those who are in the experience in the community, called action or bottom-up or grassroots mobilization. So that there are these two ways of getting at the issue of, of change. Well, as you point out, in epidemiology, public health, there's a tendency for policy experts to use already collected data on the way in which health issues are distributed around the, the country and so on. So there is, in this framing, what constitutes really hard-nosed empirical science, the notion that quantitative data are the real data because they are without regard to the subjective experiences of those right, on the ground. But it also turns out that this provides no megaphone for those in the experience. Ethnography is a way of giving a, a voice to those who are experiencing, whether it's diabetes, um, smoking issues, I mean a whole host of issues in, in, mental, in, the, in the public health school can be better understood, or at least understood as a complementary feature, to the public health issues of policy top-down, uh, the language which comes out of uh, looking at census data, um, the distribution of morbidity figures, mortality figures, which is legitimate and which is useful and which I always encourage people to do. But it's the complementarity between the two. Policy top-down, mobilization uh, bottoms up. You can't have mobilization bottoms up if you're only using the data sets which are already collected data. The beauty of Harry Levine's work in New York City, which I quoted, was that what Harry did was talk to police officers and what he found was quite disturbing. That the arrest data that we just look at, the arrest data, actually part of it is explained by what time of day those arrests are made. They are made often at 4.30 in the afternoon. Why? Overtime. Yeah, overtime. So the police get an arrest at 4.30. They go back to the police station. They've got two and a half, three hours of overtime. Now, you can't get that from the arrest data. But if you go into the experience of the police and you give them the capacity to tell you what's happening, to give them voice, you get an extraordinarily bit of, <laughs> extraordinary amount of insight as to why these figures look the way they do. You don't go into upper... <laughs> east side of New York City to make the arrest. You go into, um, you know, the Harlem area, you go into Spanish Harlem. Uh, you get these kids are age 18, 19, sometimes even earlier, and you've got overtime. That's just an example. There are other questions. We're coming upon the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement this fall, and I think the university is planning various things. 
I'm, my question to you is, if you were sort of in charge of this, uh, how would you like the campus to celebrate the 50th anniversary and the kind of impacts it might have on current students who weren't around during that time? Well, I was just having this discussion with, with Claude Steele about, you know, when, when I was a kid and I was uh, growing up as a teenager, I would hear my uncles talk about the Great Depression. And I thought it was such a boring topic. I mean, I'd heard it every time they got together, the Great Depression, the Great Depression. Well, the, the free speech movement has that feature to today's college students. It's like a millennia away. The, for me, Great Depression was only about 35 years away. For them, it's like, you know, 100 years away. So I think the first task uh, is to try to draw the connective tissue between what happened in the free speech movement and what's happening today. And that requires analysis, theory, and of course, a lot of empirical work about how people are feeling about their capacity to express themselves or a lack of a movement around voice. So I wish I had a magical answer, but the main thing I would say about this issue of the free speech movement is how alien and foreign it is. And our task as educators should be to try to draw the salience of what happened in the free speech movement um, to what's happening today. And that's the task, because it's not clear that we move from 1964, where there were only 1.3% of the students at Berkeley were African American. 1980s, 1990s, 9.6% African American. 2014, back down to about 3.5 or 4%. Well, there's a connection here between, therefore, what's happened in the last 10 years and what happened in the early 60s. This whole notion that we've become post-racial is now a mantra for many people, uh, and they experience it as reality because they don't see what, happens, what has happened in this last 20, 30 years. So I wish I had a clearer answer, but at least I think the notion of the, uh, of the connective tissue between events is, is the task of the, of the intellectual. I think this will be the last question. Joy, you've nicely uh, sketched how some of the research activity that's come out of the Institute has really served as a critique and challenge to kind of um, the kind of dominant, hegemonic kind of academic culture around the study of social change. I wonder if you would say something about what do you think has changed over this last 35 years? Have some of the, that mainstream academic culture, some of the more established mainstream social science disciplines been transformed themselves in yes. some ways? Uh, the, the, the language of hegemony is probably correct, um, and it remains in place. That is, it's not as though there's a transformation in how academics think about social change. I, I think that there's still a suspicion. What's changed, Michael, is there's been a, an effective insurgency for a number of young faculty who've come out of this period and the, the earlier one with the notion that this distinction between studying change and trying to affect it is a kind of arbitrary academic notion that needs to be changed. So I think the younger group of faculty um, are more likely to rethink this whole question. The problem I see as the sociologist of careers is that that hegemony is still in place. And if you want to get a, an advancement into your department and uh, become a tenured professor and later on full, you have to find a way of publishing work that seems like it's a f inside the framework of the, uh, you, term, you use the term hegemonic framing. Um, so most, most disciplines and social sciences still have this notion of the stratification of their own uh, journals. And the journals at the very top are the ones which honor this quantification. And that's counter to what I've been describing as the shifting zeitgeist around social change thinking. So even though you might have a thought that you'd be better off doing this combination of engaged learning, uh, when you go to publish something, you have to then engage the problem of who's reviewing the articles. So yes, I think there has been a shift in the last 20, 30 years, more sympathy towards social change research but not much of a shift in the stratification of journals. The idea that what you can publish 
will seem much more legitimate if it's got a lot of numbers. Well, if, it, if it's epidemiology, you're coming at it from that framework as opposed to the ethnographic uh, interpretation of why the Pima Indians have a high rate of diabetes. Thank you. Oh, we're going to have a break until 10.15, and then we'll resume. Okay, see you back here at 10.15. <laughs>